Hey guys. Hey. So I know that a lot of us are probably in the position right now where our worlds feel really small. Um, it might just be just the people who are in our house with us um, and we feel like everyone else is really far away and you know the only people that we might see outside of that are the people who pass us by at the grocery store or at the gas station um, and I think you know when that happens so many of us kind of you know it kind of starts to stir the pot builds, in us a little builds bit. Builds a pressure kind of. Yeah it builds it's we're like a little pressure cooker where you know like everything in the middle of you know this really small world becomes so much more important and so much more intense mm -hmm. than other times and you know the stress starts to mount and then you know just the littlest thing can send you from you know zero to sixty and so you know full disclosure Jordan and I were in the car today <laughs> and exactly that happened in our little small world something became huge mm -hmm. and before we knew it um, we were fighting. Know, we were fighting hardcore. <laughs> and it was like a very heated, intense discussion. And it was very, you know, um, childish and ridiculous. And we became so dug in the sand on our sides that it was uh, difficult to find the way out. Um, and so, you know, we had to really check ourselves and say, like, what's really important? And um, where do we really want to be looking in these moments? And you know how um, you know how small we perceive our world to be right now is not the reality. And where should we really be focusing our attention right now in order to remain at peace and in order to remain um, you know civil and also loving and respectful? And uh, you know just coming to that conclusion that it's all about Jesus and. Jesus has the whole world in his hands and he knows the problems and struggles that we face and uh, you know he's got them under control we don't need to stress about the details um, and you know that kind of brought us to this conclusion um, you know that's part of one of Jordan's favorite quotes Jord uh, John talked about it a few weeks ago um, it's a quote from Amy Semple McPherson and I think it wraps up really nicely where our focus and attention should be and it just goes <clears throat> in non-essentials liberty in essentials unity and in all things charity or grace and uh yeah i think that is for us like where we got i was like okay for these things that don't really matter like we just need to have like liberty with each other and we need to have grace with each other and everything um, so let's pray this morning as we get ready to f for worship with that in mind for today and for this week and the coming weeks um, yeah, so let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. We just pray that your grace would be in our hearts and minds and uh, our, your grace would pour out of us to those around us. And as we are getting pressure cooked uh, every single day, as more and more things seem to be piling on us in the year 2020, um, Lord, you would relieve that pressure through your grace, God. And we would uh, be able to just uh, lay things, small things down easily and love each other well. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I find you in the seeking, Lord, I find you in the doubt, and to know you is to love you, and to know so little else I need you, oh, how I need you, oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you, oh, Lord, I find you in the morning, Lord, I seek you every day, let my life be for your glory, woven in your threads of grace, how I need you, oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you, 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 oh, how I need you. I 
make glorious light. I will go where you shine. Break the dawn, crack the skies. Make the way back before me in your light. I will find all I need. All I need is you. Oh, light, glorious light. I will go where you shine. Break the dawn, crack the skies. Make the way back before me in your light. All I will find. All I need. All I need is you. Oh, how I need you 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 Oh, how I need you. solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon it's mercy for today faithful you have been and faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and that's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, and your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness. Your strength becomes our own And you're making me like you Clothing me in white Bringing beauty from ashes For you will have your bride Free from all her guilt And free of all her shame And known by her true name that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, you will be praised, and you will be praised with angels and saints, and we sing worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised, and you will be praised with angels and saints, we sing worthy. 
ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. of nights to say you alone can say hope of hope strength of strength all our sin is dead in the grave only one has power enough to say you alone can say you alone can say and where there is no way you make a way where no one else can reach us you find us where there is no way you make a way where no one else can reach us you find us hope of hope strength of strength all our sin is dead in the grave only one has power enough to say you alone can say oh you alone can say You find us where there is no way you make a way Where no one else can reach us You find us where there is no way you make a way Where no one else can reach us you find us where there is no way you make a way where no one else can reach us you find us It always 
nations you find us where there is no way you make a way where no one else can reach us you find us where there is no way you make a way where no one else can reach us you find us where there is no way you make a way where no one else can reach us you find Have you ever been busted for doing something good? I can, uh, I hope this story relates. I feel like it kind of does. We're just gonna go for it. Um, I remember being in high school uh, and I remember asking my mom if, for her permission, of course, to go to the lake with my friends. Uh, she said, what? no, she didn't, she didn't say no yet. She asked if there was going to be any parental supervision. And I, I want to say that I said, yes, there was, or maybe I'll get back to you. I can't remember. All I remember is she found out eventually that there wasn't going to be any parental supervision and uh, said no. I then would go on a rampage using every manipulative tactic that I could to arrange it in a way that I, that I went. <clears throat> uh, I, I believe I did, I, I did probably say things that absolutely hurt her. Uh, so it, it was also a very interesting time uh, because my dad had been gone for a couple of years uh, now, passed away for a couple of years now, and just the relationship between my mom and I was very, um, it was filled with turmoil. And so I, I'm very surprised now thinking back that my mom still said no even though this, this could have been used as a time to, uh, you know, come together, agree on something finally, uh, be in each other's good graces. Uh, but she was uh, a, a great parent, an adult, and, and, and made the right decision. Uh, being a parent myself now, having two kids, I, uh, I would have definitely done what my mom did. But she did a good thing and then was absolutely uh, ridiculed for it, uh, busted for it. And so I, I feel like going back to Acts chapter three last week, the last part, Peter and John are on this adventure. They, they, they heal somebody who's been uh, lame since he was, or crippled since he was born. So they're, they're, they're in this next stage. This next chapter is kind of like a carry. It's a continuation from the ripple effect that happened from Peter and John. 
They allowed the Holy Spirit to unction them forward and see Jesus do a miracle through them by healing a man who was crippled from from birth. So in chapter 4, it sets up, Peter is in the middle of preaching and teaching to the crowds that have gathered around them uh, after his after this miracle after, not his miracle but after Jesus does this miracle through them he is then interrupted and not only was he interrupted but all three of them Peter John and healed dude are arrested and taken to jail by the Sadducees or the ruling class of the Jewish people back then uh, <laughs> rude so <clears throat> the religious leaders what they do is then they they interrogate they threaten uh, Peter and John uh, and might as well this guy but mostly Peter and John and <clears throat> man in the middle of that Peter then does like a, a small little sermonette like a mini sermon and he's and he's speaking teaching uh, to the religious leader I mean just the the stones of this guy right now are are amazing he's definitely on fire uh with the holy spirit running through him uh then the next section uh the towards the end of the chapter it goes they're released they're released back into the community they spread the news of what had happened <clears throat> that then reaches other christian communities around jerusalem <clears throat> and everyone is stoked it also helped that the Holy Ghost did another outpouring, um, not another Pentecost, just a super cool, fresh outpouring that got everyone amped to speak about Jesus even more. Um, and I have definitely had moments like that where it felt like another fresh outpouring of the Spirit, and then it's this man, like, <laughs> you, you just, you, the first person you see, you just want to talk to them uh, about, about, about God. It's, it's, um, it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> Maybe that hasn't happened to you, but it's definitely happened to me. But let's join up with Peter, Paul, and healed dude. I said Paul. Let's join up with Peter and John along with the healed dude and see what all the commotion about is about in Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I'm going out of the voice translation. I think it is such an amazing translation uh, for picturing the story in our heads as it takes place. So, starting in verse 1. The conversation continued for a few hours there in Solomon's porch. Suddenly, Solomon's porch is just a, it's one of the gates of the temple. Suddenly, the head of the temple police and some members of the Sadducean party interrupted Peter and John. They were annoyed because Peter and John were enthusiastically teaching that in Jesus, resurrection of the dead is possible, an idea the Sadducees completely rejected. <clears throat> so they arrested Peter, John, and the man who was healed and kept them in jail overnight. But during these few afternoon hours between the man's miraculous healing and their arrest, Peter and John already had convinced about 5,000, so many people, 5,000 more people to believe their message about Jesus. The next morning, the Jewish leaders, their officials, elders, and scholars called the meeting in Jerusalem, presided over by Annas, the patriarch of the ruling priestly clan, along with Caiaphas, his son-in-law, John, Alexander, and other members of their clan. They made their prisoners stand in the middle of the assembly and question them. They said, who gave you the authority to create that spectacle in the temple yesterday? So, a couple things here. <clears throat> In, in verse 2, it gives a little insight into the cultural life uh, for your typical Sadducee. Uh, they believed that resurrection from the dead is impossible. Not only did they not believe that was possible, they, they actually didn't think that there was any kind of life after death, actually. Uh, so when you got people like these two yehus, right, in their mind, telling everybody that there is, like it is possible, 
that there is resurrection after death. You got problems. You got problems because one, you are the ruling class of the Jewish people. So yes, there are Pharisees, but they weren't necessarily the ruling class. The Pharisees were amongst the people and they basically were the ones that came up with all the oral laws, and oral traditions, adding on to that. The Sadducees, they didn't even adhere to that. They were just the Pentateuch, that was where they stayed. And then uh, they were very deep into politics, um, very affluent in that, in that way, and very influential in that way. <clears throat> so they were so deep into politics, actually, that they, they had ties with the Roman government as well, on top of already being very affluent and influential. Uh, they had the Romans incentivizing them to ensure that everyone was behaving nicely. Why? Because the Roman government didn't want to have to squash, take the time, take the resources to squash more than once in regards, so to, to, to squash another organized rebellion, which they had already done a couple times already with, these, with the Jewish people. Uh, so they're just trying to keep things in order and the Sadducees were like, We'll do it, uh, especially if we got some bonuses going on. Two, you believe as a Sadducee that there is no resurrection from the dead. So right now, you not only have someone saying that it is possible, but they just healed a crippled dude that's been at the same gate every day for 40 plus years. Now, it's a miracle that's taken place. And as a Sadducee, especially one that had frequented the temple, you would know who this guy was. So you know it's a miracle. You can't explain it, you don't believe it, because you've been taught that way, and you've taught others to think that way, but it definitely happened, you can't explain it. So now it looks really bad, because if people at first didn't believe that there's resurrection after death, what's stopping them now after a healing like this? So people are going to be believing for sure. However, the Sadducees' annoyance at Peter and John's witness as far as the resurrection was not so much theological as it was political. The idea of a general resurrection was an apocalyptic concept uh, with all sorts of messianic uh, overtones, uh, messianic ideas among the Jews of the day, uh, that meant revolt. It meant overthrow of the foreign overlords. Uh, it meant restoration of the Davidic kingdom. So how many of us asking us this question, ourselves this question, how many of us were paying attention in the Gospels? Heck, we could even go to Acts chapter 1, which we just went over. Uh, pay attention in the Gospel. All four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give an account of Jesus' people thinking, wanting, and attempting to make him their earthly ruler over and over and over and over again. They believed that this was the sign from God that Jesus would blast the Romans from existence and the kingdom of David would be restored again and everyone would live happily ever after. But that never happened. And I hope that it was just because they missed it. Because I, I feel like, this is just me personally, this is not the Bible saying this, me personally, I feel like that if they missed it, there's still just at least like a, like a shred of grace, I guess, that you could kind of go off of. Um, because if those interpreters knew that Jesus was the Savior, and knew that he was going to restore the kingdom, but that kingdom had nothing to do with politics or them, and they killed him to protect their coffers. <laughs> Oof. Like, 
I, I don't I don't see any I don't see any scrap of grace in there for that. Uh, and I'm not pretending to, I, I don't feel like as human beings, we understand the full eternal cost, like uh, the, the full eternal, uh, we don't have a grasp on grace um, other than what we can see and read in the gospel. Uh, so I'm not pretending to understand that. I just feel like if that's the way it happened, you're protecting yourself, you're protecting your way of life because you might be comfortable or <clears throat> you like living in that luxury, it's, it's sweet, that you would kill over it. Mm, that's pretty gnarly. Getting back to it, you start talking about people coming back to life, you're gonna get public unrest with this crowd. You get public unrest, your cush life goes right out the window when you're a Sadducee. So what do you do? Well, you arrest and then you threaten and then that should solve it. We'll see. Let's pick it up. Verse seven. They made their prisoners stand in the middle of the assembly and questioned them. Who gave you the authority to create that spectacle in the temple yesterday? Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Rulers and elders of the people, yesterday a good deed was done. Someone who was sick was healed. If you're asking us how this happened, I want all of you and all of the people of Israel to know this man standing in front of you, obviously in good health, was healed by the authority of Jesus of Nazareth, the anointed one. This is the same Jesus whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. He is the stone that you builders rejected, who has become the very stone that holds together the entire foundation on which a new temple is being built. Dude, <clears throat> Peter's laying it down. There's no one else who can rescue us, and there's no other name under heaven given to any human by whom we may be rescued. Now the leaders were surprised and confused. <laughs> they looked at Peter and John and realized that they were typical peasants, uneducated, utterly ordinary fellows with extraordinary confidence. The leaders recognized them as companions of Jesus. Verse 14. Then they turned their attention to the third man standing beside them, recently lame, now standing tall and healthy. What could they say in response to all of this? Because they were at a loss about what to do, they excused the prisoners so the council could deliberate in private. What do we do with these fellows? Anyone who lives in Jerusalem will know an unexplainable sign has been performed through these two preachers. We can't deny their story. The best we can do is try to keep it from spreading. So let's warn them to stop speaking to anybody in this name. The leaders brought the prisoners back in and prohibited them from doing any more speaking or teaching in the name of Jesus. Peter and John listened quietly and then replied, You are the judges here, so we'll leave it up to you to judge whether it is right in the sight of God to obey your command or God's. But one thing we can tell you, we cannot possibly restrain ourselves from speaking about what we have seen and heard with our own eyes and ears. The council, the council threatened them again, but finally let them go because public opinion strongly supported Peter and John and this man who had received this miraculous sign. He was over 40 years old, so his situation was known to many people, and they couldn't help but glorify God for his healing. Trip out on Peter. The voice translation has these little blurps in between scriptures sometimes. Uh, to highlight uh, different things. I, I love what this highlight says. It says the Holy Spirit changes everyone and everything. If there's any doubt about the power of the Spirit, just take a look at Peter. 
When Jesus was captured, Peter cowered in fear that he might be identified as a man who loved Jesus. Now the same man is preaching healing and pointing his finger in the face of Jewish Jewish officials who have captured him and John with a boldness that is not his own. He blames them for the death of Jesus and does not cower at their show of violence. That's, (laughs) that gives me, that gives me hope. That gives me hope. I also want to go and visit verse 16. That's the part where the Sadducees are deliberating in regards to Peter, John, and the healed dude. Verse 16, what do we do with these fellows? Anyone who lives in Jerusalem will know an unexplainable sign has been performed through these two preachers. We can't deny their story. The best we can do is try to keep it from spreading. So let's warn them to stop speaking to anybody in his name. These are people that had a very privileged lifestyle. They lived that way when everything was in a very controlled environment. Uh, politically, um, politically wise, all that stuff was very controlled. This is what crushes my soul, is that these, they're, they're people. I am also people. So I have I I can slip into doing stuff like this as well if I'm also a human being. So it, it, it challenges me every day to be able to look into myself. If I call myself a Christian, what am I doing to actually be accountable to that? Am I actually loving people like Jesus loved them? Am I actually loving my neighbor how, how, I would, how I would best love to be loved as a person. Like, am I doing that? And where did they lose it? Because it's not like the religious leaders, they didn't start out bad. Like, they held it down for a lot of decades and centuries, and it was great. They started off great, and then... They just lost it. I don't know if it became about them or, well, it obviously did become about them. We must, all, we must always be pressing into the Holy Spirit, guys, of, of looking into ourselves and always be working, always be working, always putting in the work. At least we end up in a place where it's just all about having control and and being in a a place above people. That's not not what Jesus came to do. Let's let's join up again in in verse 23. Uh, Peter and John, upon their release, went right to their friends and told the story, including the warning from the council. The whole community responded with this prayer to God. Now imagine that you're the community and you're praying this as a community throughout, not just in one pocket, but like lots of pockets. This is everyone's agreeing to this type of prayer. God, our King, you made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything they contain. You are the one who, by the Holy Spirit, spoke through our ancestor David, your servant, with these words. Why did the nations rage? Why did they imagine useless things? The kings of the earth took their stand. Their rulers assembled in opposition against the eternal one and his anointed king. This is exactly what has happened among us here in this city. The foreign ruler, Pontius Pilate, and the Jewish ruler, Herod, along with their respective peoples, have assembled in opposition to your holy servant, Jesus, the one you chose. They have done whatever your hand had planned, predetermined, should happen. And now, Lord, take note of their intimidations intended to silence us. Grant us, your servants, the courageous confidence we need to go ahead and proclaim your message while you reach out your hand to heal people, enabling us to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Basically saying, God, Jesus, can you please, can you please give us the boldness to continue spreading 
these good things in spite of opposition. They finished their prayer and immediately, verse 31, finished their prayer, immediately the whole place where they had gathered began to shake. All the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began speaking God's message with courageous confidence. During those days, the entire community of believers was deeply united in heart and soul to such an extent that they stopped claiming private ownership of their possessions. Instead, they held everything in common the apostles with great power gave their eyewitnesses, eyewitness reports of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Everyone was surrounded by an extraordinary grace. Not a single person in the community was in need because those who had been affluent sold their houses or lands and brought the proceeds to the emissaries of the Lord. They then distributed the funds to individuals according to their needs. One fellow, a Cyprian Levite named Joseph, earned a nickname because of his generosity in selling a field and bringing the money to the apostles in this way. From that time on, they called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Well, I guess their plan of arresting and threatening backfired. It actually made things worse for the ruling religious leaders at that time. When the Holy Spirit pours out a freshness and that freshness emboldens people to speak more about the good things of Jesus, whoo you gotta watch out. You gotta watch out. That healing, however, this, and this is something that I think we really need to take into account too. That healing did not deliver them from danger. If anything, it provoked it. Those Christians knew what the cost would be if they continued to speak about Jesus. That's why they prayed. They knew the weight of it. They knew that these guys that somehow released Peter and John were the same guys that condemned Jesus to the cross and murdered him. They know the stakes. They're high. So they prayed. Their prayer was answered by the shaking of the house. Perhaps a shaking from uh, thunder, um, maybe like a 3.0 like earthquake, I don't know. But it gave them a tangible sense, like a tangible sense of God's presence and his response to their prayer. And their prayer was fulfilled at once. Immediately, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word with boldness, just as they had petitioned. There is so much opportunity out there right now for Jesus to do good. And he insists on partnering with us. That means he believes in me and he believes in you. Let us pray that the Holy Spirit would pour out a boldness that is fueled by the unquenchable love of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we, we come together as, um, as a family, as a part of the greater body. Um, we come together and ask that at the center of all of us would be an unquenchable love. Uh, that unquenchable love exists because of, because of you being at the center <laughs> and doing what you did to still have a relationship with a creation that would much rather not want a relationship with you. You sacrificed everything. You gave everything. We, can, we, we come so... We can't even scratch the surface of how awesome your love is or how awesome your love is for us. So we ask in desperation as, this, as our world right now is in a worldwide pandemic, we ask uh, in the United States as a nation, as its political and civic crazy lawlessness, just psycho stuff's happening, everywhere with the nation. We ask as a, as a state who, who, that, that, is, that is definitely on fire, literally on fire, 
And then even at a local level where this body finds itself, these fires are so close to home. Jesus, right now, it can seem like, <laughs> like the end of the world, man. Like 2020, this is, this is insane, especially to our, our body here. But God, it's not. You resurrected from the grave. That's what we're all counting on. That's what it's all about. You've given us life. You've given us that life abundantly. So I would pray that with that unquenchable love, Jesus, that we would posture ourselves in a, in a place of, uh, in a posture of, of being taught, of, 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 of hearing, of listening, of learning, so that you can teach us what that means uh, taking your love that you have, you've shown us, and really pushing that out to people around us, not in a way to gain accolades, not in a way that would boost our pride or our arrogance, but in a purest, purest love. I also pray that we would continue to go into that, go into that unquenchable love and, and really look into ourselves and really check ourselves constantly that we are doing what you would be wanting us to do. Loving people like you love them. Loving, loving our neighbors like ourselves. You are such an amazing and incredible God. Amen. Hi there, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'm so encouraged and so excited to be part of a church family that is not only faithful in their giving when tomorrow seems promised, but we're a church family that is faithful in our giving when tomorrow seems unknown and when it's not convenient. So if you would like to give today, here are the ways. You can go to our website, harvestlands.org, go to the giving tab. You can text the word harvestlands the number 77977. You'll receive a text message and it'll give you instructions on how to give. You can also send a check to the Harvest Lands PO Box 2, Salinas, California 93902. If you are someone who may want to give a little extra, if I can suggest the Benevolence Fund. The Benevolence Fund will be used with the discretion of our financial counsel for those of us who maybe have lost our jobs or lost part of our income. And if you are that person, I please want to encourage you to email us at theharvestlands at gmail.com or call us at 831-757-3677. I love you guys. I hope you know you're not alone. And I hope this message today was encouraging and helps you point to Jesus and to reflect his love.